Bloom. If the name sounds familiar, then you probably were a kid or teenager in the 80s, just like me. If you played this game not long after it came out, as I did in 1991, then you can understand the kind of enchantment it was back then. Loom wasn't really groundbreaking, it didn't bring any major change to the gaming scene, but it perfected an existing genre. It brought the graphical adventure to a new level of maturity. You could expect to know less from Lucasfilm Games, and this project led by Brian Moriarty was a masterpiece of its own. Loom has superior graphics, soundtrack, and an ironclad scenario. It also adds a little touch of its own to the point-and-click adventure games, with a unique user interface based on musical notes. All these aspects put together make Loom an outstanding game despite its few drawbacks, the main one being its simplicity level. So let's dive deeper into this mysterious and enchanting universe. It's the same for gaming as for cooking. Good recipes demand a subtle combination of reagents put together in careful doses and in timely fashion. Loom successfully achieves this concept with its three main ingredients that we'll detail one by one throughout this video. It also uses a few additional spices for an even better flavor. One of these is the packaging. I really like the box cover illustrations, especially on the back. And since I bought it back in the day, I can tell you that this box really stood out among other games on the store shelves. Big box games of the 80s and 90s were generally good looking for sure, but this one was just beautiful. It contains either three and a half or five and a quarter inch set of discs, an ancient looking magical booklet where you could register the spells or drafts you learned, which also contained patterns to use for the copy protection system, and an audio cassette on which you could hear the excellent storyline played by professional actors. Let's fire up the game so you can see how the copy protection works. It's a classic system where you must highlight the right set of notes from the manual based on what is mentioned on screen. As you pass the test, you're greeted with one of the most beautiful intro scenes in games thus far. Now, the principal ingredients in Loom are graphics and music. They're not only superb all by themselves, but they also fit together perfectly well. And how could it be otherwise, since the soundtrack is none other than the adaptation of Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake, an all-time masterpiece of classical music? And the original graphic design by Mark Ferrari makes masterful use of dithering effects. Music is not only a background component, it's also the way your character interacts with the world. So we can say it's the main component of all. We'll detail both graphics and music in a short while. But first, let's finish listing the recipe. The third ingredient is the solid scenario. That adds all its consistency to the game. Let's begin with it. The world of Loom is structured about guilds, each one specialized in a particular skill. The Guild of Weavers, to which you belong, established themselves as masters of woven fabric, though they eventually transcended the limits of cloth and began to weave the very fabric of reality, using the Great Loom. They were persecuted for these acts of witchcraft and banned to an island off the main coast. You play Bobbin Threadbare, a teenage boy who uses musical drafts to affect the world around him. Bobbin is summoned by the elders in order to determine his fate. He arrives the sanctuary in time to witness his foster mother, Hetchel, punished by the elders for educating him with magical skills. Hetchel. 
Hitchell is turned to a swan's egg. But then a swan comes down from the sky and crashes through the window in the sanctuary. She casts the same draft on the elders, transforming them into swans. left all alone. He finds the elder's distaff, and his career as a wizard begins. Throughout the adventure, Bobbin will meet his fellow members of the Weavers, then the glassmakers, the shepherds, the blacksmiths, and the clerics. The storyline is particularly compelling. Immersion is a key factor, created by a solid plot and a relatively short average playing time. The experienced gamer could complete this game in less than five hours. This makes Loom an intense gaming experience. This ephemere aspect is even more outlined by the fact that the entire adventure fits inside one single day. It begins at dawn on the Weaver's Island and ends at night at the Cleric's Cathedral. As he progresses through the lands and visits the different guilds, Bobbin discovers, little by little, the sinister plot of Bishop Mandible of the Clerics to conquer the world. At the glassmakers, he learns that Mandible has ordered a giant scythe and a magical crystal ball. At the shepherds, a herd of sheep, enough to feed an army. At the blacksmiths, 
10,000 swords. Will you be able to counter his infamous plot? Now, about graphics. The game was released in two different versions. The original 16-color EGA version, with small text dialogue, no voice, a musical overture at the beginning, and a short bonus scene if you play the expert mode. It was published for PC DOS on floppy disk in May 1990. And soon after followed the Amiga, Atari ST, and Macintosh ports. It came with a cassette tape containing a very well-made audio drama that set the stage for the story. The CD version was released for MS-DOS a couple of years later. It upgraded the color palette to 256 color VGA and featured an entirely remastered digital soundtrack, a separate CD for the audio drama, and fully voiced dialogue. But due to the technical constraints on how much uncompressed audio could fit on a CD, much of the original dialogue had to be revised or abridged. The EGA version of Loom is arguably the most beautiful game ever made for that kind of display. There's simply no other EGA game that achieves such a wonderful result. The Secret of Monkey Island could be a serious contender, with its EGA version almost as good as the VGA one. But in the case of Loom, EGA looks even better than VGA. Yes, ask anyone. They'll tell you that the 16-color version of Loom is actually better than the 256-color one. That's due to the superb dithering technique used for the background. Like Orson Welles said, the enemy of art is the absence of limitations. For the original version of Loom, artist Mark Ferrari had to cope with a 16-color palette. The results of his efforts really look awesome and we can immediately discern a specific style that brings a real personality to the game. On the other hand, the VGA version, made by another team, tries to look realistic rather than artistic. It feels less sharp and detailed. Its choice of colors is poor, and some screens almost look ugly, as we can see in the comparative samples you see here. I'm convinced that the dreamlike rendering of old games is one of their principal attractive features when they didn't try to look realistic, but instead offered an artistic style of their own. Here's how the game runs on my Amstrad PC1640 with an 8086 CPU and EGA card. Pretty much the same as on the IBM PS2 or this Amstrad 286. But for all of that, Loom would have only been a pale shadow of itself without the music. In here I was confronted with a dilemma. Normally, my video making policy is to stick as much as possible to the same technical configurations that I used back in the day. I did play the original EGA version of Loom, and that's good, but I also had the stock PC speakers as the only audio source. So for this particular video, I've made an exception to the rule and used the superb soundtrack from the Roland MT32 sound card instead. Not that the PC speaker is very bad, in fact, I think it's a very good result as compared to many other games, but hey, it's about great classical music score here. I'll let you hear different scenes in both versions, so you can form your own opinion.
After much reflecting, I've decided to split the difference. Let the sound card play actual music and the speaker for all other sounds. So we have it both ways and my video policy is still valid uh, to some extent. The music in Loom does not play throughout, but is limited to key moments, heightening the dramatic tension. When it occurs, it is a real treat and appears amazingly well suited to the ambiance of the game. Interestingly, music is not the only thing borrowed from Tchaikovsky's piece, The Swan Lake, since swans are obviously major characters in the game, and at the end, Bobbin finds the lake itself. I wonder why so few games are using arranged versions of classical themes like Loom does. It obviously adds a powerful dimension and is guaranteed quality. It also lets younger people discover classical works they could otherwise have missed. Last in the recipe for Loom, add a little novelty to the user interface. Instead of having a typical adventure game verb list, use, get, talk to, you must learn short musical drafts. The gameplay centers around these magical four note tunes that you play using your distaff. Each draft is a spell that can usually be reversed by playing the notes backwards. So for instance, the open draft played backwards becomes close. You can learn drafts by observing an object that possesses the qualities of the desired draft. For example, by examining a blade while it is being sharpened, Bobby can learn the sharpening draft. When the game begins, you are only able to play drafts on three notes. As the game progresses and additional notes become available, so your ability to play new drafts increases. The game can be played at three difficulty levels, each differing in how clearly the notes being played are labeled. For example, the standard level indicates the notes on a scale below the distaff. While the expert level shows no notes, it must be played by ear only. Loom differs from other point-and-click adventure games in that there is no inventory to collect. The staff is your only possession. This makes it unique, and in my opinion, it's a great idea. But having no inventory also quite simplifies the game. And that brings us to our last topic. The main drawback of the game is, obviously, the difficulty level. The puzzle complexity isn't very high. Since there's no items to manage, every puzzle is solved by using musical drafts. Their limited number makes all obstacles quite easy to overcome. The player is not given great freedom to explore the world, and the game is very linear. Okay then, Loom is short, but Loom is great. Sure, it's not the funniest game like Monkey Island or Maniac Mansion. It doesn't have the action scenes of Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade or The Fate of Atlantis. It's neither as long nor as varied as almost any other adventure game. But it is certainly the most beautiful in one of the most credible fantasy worlds. In the galaxy of point-and-click adventure games that had their shot in the late 1980s and the early 90s, Loom is one of the most closed and scripted. You have a rather limited range of actions, and you can't do anything that would let you end up stuck. Perfect for beginners, you would say. 
But Loom is so enchanting that it also attracts seasoned players, despite its low difficulty level. Not only because it's a festival to your eyes and your ears, but also because it conveys the feeling of a consistent world, as far as fantasy worlds can be. The world of Loom has a deep personality of its own. It seems to come out of a fantasy book series written by a skilled author, rather than some game designer's fancy. Not so many games are able to achieve that kind of feeling. And Loom is a shining gem among them. Since this is a review, not a walkthrough solution, let's not give away the entire plot and avoid too many spoilers. If you haven't played the game yet, you definitely should. It's an amazing experience. And all the better if you can do it on a good old PC, Amiga, or Atari from that wonderful era.